Thank you very much, Chui. I'm from Cliff Decker, and Danny, who, Nidu, who will do the thank you, is from Mazars. We are from two different firms, but you'll see we wear the same clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got striped blue shirts and blue ties, and Danny's got exactly the same. He's just newer than mine, though. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my, my pleasure to introduce Gareth Bleuer to you tonight. Um, Gareth is the heads up the economic policy in the Cape Town region, and uh, I also noticed that uh, Gareth had quite a lot to do with renewable energy, and that for us as Cliff Decker Hofmeyer and Mazars is, is quite an important thing. On the Cliff Decker Hofmeyer side, we, we worked on 16 of the 28 first projects that the government uh, awarded in the renewable energy phase, and we at this stage busy with the third phase thereof. And we have recently jointly, Mazars and Cliff Decker, hosted a presentation to developers in that field. It's become a very important aspect uh, of our lives in South Africa. Gareth, I think, looks about 10 to me when I met the first time, but he's had a very full, lived a very full life. He's an elective uh, public representative and chairperson of the Economic, Environment and Spatial Planning Portfolio in the city of Cape Town, having been appointed by the mayor and in 2011. And I asked him a little bit earlier, what has he done in his life? And he said, this is what he's been doing so far. So you're doing very well, I understand, Gareth. His fiduciary duties include policy, strategy, and oversight for the city's region's 3.7 million residents. And as a current member of the City of Cape Town's University's Research Com Committee, Gareth has undergraduate and graduate degrees from UCT, where he is currently a member of the University's Governing Council and is a former student representative council vice president. He has participated in programs in other universities, in Princeton University, in Oxford and uh, Cambridge, and as an A.B. Bailey Fellow, while serving as the youngest ever elected member of the prestigious Mount Pelerin Society. I looked up what the society has done, and I've never, because I'd never heard of it before, and it's a very interesting society. It was established after World War II, and when many of the values of the Western civilization were imperiled, and this society then agreed that it would, that it would consisting mostly of economists with some historians and philosophers, they were invited by Professor Friedrich von Hayek to meet at Mount Pelerin, and they discussed their philosophies relating to the, the, re, the retention of the economic values of the world as we knew it at that stage. And this is what they're all about. Very, very interesting. Um, Gareth is a board member of the Cape Town Partnership and has experience in the tech sector, working on startups in Cape Town and Silicon Valley, and he said that's what he did after university. He has additional experience in low-income microfinance provision, Kai Litcher, and consulting as an associate at the Johannesburg-based Corpcom. Uh, Gareth is a prolific writer and international speaker, with work appearing across over two dozen publications and academic journals, including the Journal of Entrepreneurship and Public Policy, Fitz Business Journal, and the African Yearbook of Rhetoric. In 2008, he received a Culture of Enterprise Award from the former U.S. Attorney General, Edwin Meese III, for his research into enterprise and humane economy, and a separate award from the Cape Town Press Club for over 500 published articles as a student journalist and a blogger. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Gareth Bleu to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe. I think it's fine. Thanks. Well, good evening to each one of you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I have to say there were a couple of things I thought about when I was asked to offer up a topic, and mainly it was around credibility, because you asked the question, well, what is public policy? Well, is in politics, so perhaps that's acceptable. Well, what about entrepreneurship? Maybe it's a bit of placation. I see entrepreneurs sometimes have some suspicion, rightly so, towards government. But moral vision and values, and uh, oh, please, may say the cynics, but I think all of these things do come together very importantly. And what I would like to do today, perhaps reflecting in my capacity as a philosophy student of this university, UCT, is to look at a moral case for enterprise and entrepreneurship. And to speak about entrepreneurship as a first principle beyond just it being something expressed in public policy. So I'd like to make an assertion perhaps in this discussion, first of all, that there is such a thing as 
as a human nature, and you may think Jesus is an odd start, but really what I would mean by that is nothing to do with mortal sin uh, and whether or not you have a religious conviction, but simply that there are shared traits that human beings appear to possess across every single society, and uh, we get that in anthropology um, and the social sciences. And one of the recurring aspects of the human being is creativity, the enormous potential of persons across the world to think, to exercise reason, uh, and to produce new things and to create. And I think that is at the heart of entrepreneurship. And it's critical, in my view, to point this out conceptually, because I think sometimes there's a cultural differentiation amongst entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship requires certain institutions to make it flourish, a certain legal framework, an appreciation of the role of markets. And many people would say that that is a cultural assertion, that it's, it's Western, so to speak. And I would argue that, in fact, it's far more universal if you look at societies across the board. And so I think it would be a fallacy to create that dichotomy at a, at a societal level. So a moral claim essentially seeks to make an argument that is apparent across all societies for human beings. Now, despite the UN Declaration of Human Rights in the field of democracy, um, we have a recognition that all of us, regardless of nationality, gender, um, or ethnicity, have inalienable human rights. But I think many concepts of entrepreneurship and its supporting institutions are still touted as perhaps Western, and entrepreneurship is not seen as a first principle um, from which other institutions and regulations must flow. And I think the traits required of the entrepreneur that I wish to argue are no more apparent in one society any more than another, um, but are fairly inherent. And I would like to express some examples to lay credence to that claim. Human beings all seek ways to make that political freedom the UN affirms meaningful. Um, but of course that political freedom is meaningful with material conditions that matter, a society that is actually fostered by real tangible opportunity. And it's no surprise that we see when people feel in conditions uh, of hopelessness that they do not have a stake in the system and of course populism arises. So of course with the right to vote every five years is the ability to have a material well-being. So an economically free person whether they're an entrepreneur or not, and it's just a premise or framework to the talk, must be free to enter the market voluntarily. Hence, those who have the power to interfere with the market, and sometimes credibly so, such as those in government, are duty-bound to remove any artificial barrier, artificial barrier to entry to the market, and also at the same time to protect both private and shared property rights. The wealth that makes entrepreneurship meaningful comes from the act of creation, of human creativity, which is something inherently entrepreneurial. Everything we see around us have to have been, has to have been created somehow. And I would pause to reflect that I cannot tax anything that has not already been created uh, by society at large. And I think that's an important recognition for those who do have expectations of government or, or myself, which are really, you know, fairly impossible to meet. But the role of the entrepreneur here is critically important because it's in that enabling environment that we see meaningful material change. So hence here, a moral case for entrepreneurship it's a much about ethics as the first principle in my view, as is the very notion of the right to vote, human rights um, under the equality of law. It's a first principle as opposed to a public policy prerogative in and of itself. Um, we don't disagree with the first principle of human rights or equality of, under the law, and I wish to make an argument of that same nature within the context of entrepreneurship. And so that would be the departure point from which we would deduce other things like tax rates and uh, kinds of regulations and safety requirements and all those other things that we have. So what is entrepreneurship? What do I mean by it? Because I do notice that there are a whole variety of definitions usually created according to whoever wishes to make a particular argument or claim. And I would say simply this. It's the willingness to take risks of time and capital in the pursuit of creating something that does not exist. And that's something being an enterprise which is the product of somebody or some people coordinating others and products and services for an outcome that serves people's fellow citizens through the market or through the pricing mechanism. It is not a program or a course or another certificate, uh, something the city sponsors. Of course, some of that can lend assistance to the entrepreneur, but um, that in itself would not be sufficient. And I think nor is it about survival because we deal with an enormous amount of informal trading. And I think in that case, what I would say is that though the entrepreneurial spirit often comes out, and I see this in, in so many informal traders when our backs are against the wall, many of those people are in informal trading because they cannot find a job. So they have not necessarily chosen that, and I think inherent to entrepreneurship is that decision, uh, the decision to create jobs versus a substitute of perhaps merely looking for a job. Um, and of course, then the whole issue of protecting informal traders is part of the general right to, to protecting enterprise but that would be a separate issue. 
So before I go any further, I would say that a moral case for entrepreneurship in the context of this talk does not mean we should all become entrepreneurs, or that I advance that it's better than another profession, even politics, but it means people choose it, and they have the ability to choose entrepreneurship, not just as an ambition, i.e. I aspire to be an entrepreneur, but actually to be able to live out that entrepreneurship in conditions that do not hamper free enterprise. And I propose a lesser case of actual policies because I know that could risk some partisanship, particularly uh, here, but really to look at the moral imperative because South Africa has great policies. We possess one of the greatest in constitutions in the world. Many would say the best, and I'm certainly not biased there. Great policies, great plans, but many are not fulfilled. And I think where are so many of us when this does not happen? Where's the imperative of the outcry in a situation where these policies are not fulfilled and the ability of this country to realize the potential from entrepreneurship is certainly not readily apparent? And I would say part of the argument lies in the fact that entrepreneurship has not been a first principle out there with other inherent rights which we persist, uh, which, which we protect. And I think we need a moral vision that goes beyond the public policy debate or any sort of partisan, do we support the NDP or do, do we not, um, beyond efficiency and actually into the good. And I'd like to go into some arguments around the role of entrepreneurship in the common good uh, and in achieving the material conditions that obviously make life meaningful for people. Now, there are myths, concerns, stereotypes, and prejudices, I think, against entrepreneurs. Um, and when I speak about entrepreneurs, I don't refer you to business people or managerial professionals. Um, and I think important distinction is business versus entrepreneurship. Because certainly a case for entrepreneurship is not always a case for business. Uh, one could certainly argue big business in certain industries have by their actions undermined entrepreneurship, coddling all over the world close to the powers that be and uh, either promoting expansive government corporate welfare or even just proposing regulations that hinder access to the market by new players. So those who, and uh, I do, do excuse me if it comes across as harsh, but I would say that those, regardless of their size, who use the state to lobby for regulations and practices like this corporate subsidies, onus regulations, that the poor simply cannot meet or cannot compete with, are really politicians in effect. They're something of an unelected class who are often with the shadows, uh, in the shadows and close to those who have a monopoly on power. And that's not competition, that's not dynamism. And I think it's very important that entrepreneurs are distinguished uh, from more crude assessments of, of the capitalists or uh, greedy business people. And I think that practice that we see where you've got the state as a monopoly and you've got business close to it is one certainly in which customers, each one of us as participants in the market, are not served, but in fact we're exploited because we are not getting the, the best price that we would get in a society based on choice. And then I would say into the nature of entrepreneurs and the internal qualities that you require to possess as someone who chooses business, as someone who chooses to leave the comfort zone, are fairly significant and I think are oftentimes undermined uh, simply by an assessment that the entrepreneur is purely pursuing profit and cannot simply be preoccupied with anything else. And uh, some of this is fairly qualitative because it is a philosophical discussion, but it's based on some interviews I had throughout my time doing research, various published articles, and that is that there are ethical values implicit in entrepreneurship and that the act of entrepreneurship provides the opportunity for people to exercise certain virtues. And the philosopher Michael Novak uses this precise term as old-fashioned as it is, saying that in his studies on business, and he's a Templeton winner, uh, and certainly well-recognized, patience, perseverance, service, and hard work are often the characteristics of the entrepreneur. And these key traits allow people to serve the world through their inventiveness and their creativity, and resourcefulness and industriousness, together with the hope in the future, are key aspects of the personality traits of these people. And I think hope in the future is probably most important in the South African context, given the expressions of uncertainty that we so often hear. To create a new enterprise and then to sustain it requires hard work, drive, perseverance, patience, and things that are usually just far too enormous for many of us to want to undertake. Entrepreneurs are change agents in a society by virtue of their willingness to risk and tolerate risk in the pursuit of a greater end. And I would pause here to remind ourselves of the number of individuals who will place their houses on the, uh, to the bond, who will have their savings and investments put on the line, all in a pursuit of a project for which they have no guarantee of success, but they're willing to tolerate that possibility of failure in pursuit of offering a service or a product that has not yet been seen in the market. And these internal traits give the impetus to the entrepreneurial impulse. 
They allow for the entrepreneur to give expression to previously untested services, products, and even theories in the market. And I think of Raymond Ackerman, who served uh, and who learnt under Professor Hutt here at UCT. And Hutt was largely maligned. He spoke about the great thing of competition and rivalry and pricing and an open market at a time where people were very suspicious. And they said Keynesian, you know, Keynesianism and government spending, that's, that's better. But Raymond Ackerman told me that he took that to heart. And he understood that to have a successful business required something of a moral vision. And so I asked him, well, how would you express yourself or your role now at the end of your life? And he says, I'm just the green grocer who got lucky. But he speaks about his theory uh, or his acceptance of that theory of service um, and prices and profit as a way of measuring that ability to serve. Now, I'd like to touch briefly on the whole concept of profit because one of the things I find, particularly when I deal with entrepreneurs who are emerging in communities still fairly marginalized from the economy, is a sense of apologizing for attempting to make a profit. And I would refer here by saying that profit provides the measure by which we determine human needs, meet the desires of people, and spur innovation. Material needs, of course. Um, there's certain things you cannot buy or trade on the market, as we all know. Thomas E. Woods notes that without a profit motive, he's a historian from, uh, from Harvard or based at Harvard for a time, without that profit motive, there's no certain way in which the morally desirable uh, uh, intent to improve one's condition and provide for one's family and loved ones, there's no way it can be pursued in a way that benefits oneself and society at large without profit. With profit indicating where greatest demand is and greatest need, human beings can channel their energies into their most important areas of economic life. It would be impossible for a government or an individual to go ask everybody in the world, what do you feel like today? What are you going to feel like tomorrow? But that ability of the pricing mechanism to allow for innovation, to send signals of supply and demand are actually very, very legitimate. And uh, Professor Hutt, of course, set out the explication, defense and application of this proposition that profit-seeking entrepreneurs not tied to the state but acting independently in the conditions where wages uh, and particularly prices are set competitively and non-coercively, that ensures the fullest utilization of resources in a manner that is in accordance with consumer preferences. And when he speaks of resources, he includes the human mind, the ability of each one of us to look at the society around us and say there is something I wish to create or bring out, there's an idea I wish to pursue. That is arguably the greatest resource and I think if you look at economies that are resource rich, contrast those that have very little, uh, the human mind certainly comes out as a far, far stronger factor and I think less likely to experience booms and busts and slows in demand as we see in some commodity markets. Now. He combines his analysis, this is Professor Hutt who, who inspired Raymond Ackerman and other entrepreneurs. He combines his analysis of the role of profit with that of the economist Ludwig von Mises, who has his theory of the socialist calculation problem, which says that in grasping such a core role of profit that is legitimate, it leads us to a recognition that liberty and that some degree of decentralization are actually important. So markets and people can freely pursue the setting of prices and the serving of needs in the market. Governments cannot determine the value and price of every transaction and subsequently meet human needs in the same way that markets can, driven by the entrepreneur. And that's, I think, has been demonstrated in several countries. It's people who are equipped to do as much. And that consequence of profit, even though it's not inherent to it, it's a kind of consequence of the reality of profit, I think is quite a firm recognition that human freedom cannot be divorced from material advancement, which in and of itself cannot exist without profit. And then Friedrich Hayek, who was referred to earlier, and I'm going to become a little less philosophical, getting on to a few more practical things in a minute, would later explicate that that freedom is critical for human welfare. Um, and without the freedom, we use, lose the ability to act morally. In a nutshell, some of the preconditions required of profit, something entrepreneurs pursue, um, are actually very, very important for society, and there's a legitimacy in that as well. And we know that in undertaking that ability to see a profit, the entrepreneur is willing to tolerate enormous amounts of risk. The argument then is concluded if you bring it back to the entrepreneur, that he or she is an agent of change less in what he or she does, but more so in the approach to life, in the core philosophy and in the willingness to think outside the box, which challenges society and requires free thinking and openness. And societies with a tolerance for free speech and for innovation often see the greatest degrees of material advancement. And the pursuits of profit, and one final defense of the entrepreneur pursuing that profit, 
uh, is that through these price mechanisms, he or she makes actual decisions to take advantage of opportunities to serve human needs. And the entrepreneur only makes that profit if he or she is in tune to the needs and wants of the marketplace. And that's a kind of other-centeredness, that even if the entrepreneur is selfish and has only the intent to serve his or her own material advancements, that other-centeredness is a consequence, whether intended or not. And unlike philanthropy, and with due respect to philanthropy, it's critically important, the focus or the locus of that act is creation, which is at the core of the entrepreneurial venture. And um, that very act of creation is fundamental to human advancement. And of course, we know Joseph Schumpeter and various economists have identified the critical role um, that happens in, in that process of, of pursuing profit, but doing so in a way that is creative. Now, entrepreneurship in and of itself, I think, has a consequence which is fairly important for democratic society and particularly for civil society. Because while material output has, uh, is great and it's important to improve our utility and to see we have access to more goods and services, that utility I don't think is a sufficient case for entrepreneurship. So it would be a bit of a materialist argument if you just say, well, our society has better goods and services and therefore we must be superior or we must be better off. Uh, and I think commodity-driven status economies, as we speak, have not necessarily improved people's lives. Well, they have improved people's lives materially, but you see this persistence of human rights abuses and of other violations of civil liberty. So growth, of course, can occur without the entrepreneur as the center. The state can drive that. But there are consequences for human dignity, for democracy, and for freedom, um, which are fairly profound. And further to that, on a pure economic argument, it would be clear that these commodity-driven economies face quite a problem when markets slow. But if you invest in entrepreneurs, uh, or at least allow them to flourish, I think the, the prospect for stability um, and for innovation to drive things is far more profound. And we can see the role of technology uh, in driving in economics, even at, uh, at times of recession and slower growth. So entrepreneurs remind us, and I could say they certainly remind me, of the institutional requirements um, for their own success. And what a true democracy requires is coincidental to the requirements or many of the requirements of democracy. It's opportunity, equality under the law, the rule of law, that certainty, honoring contracts, uh, and of course property rights. And because these conditions for enterprise correspond generally for those required for a society based on human rights and opportunity, the entrepreneur regardless of whether or not he and she intends to make this contribution to society, does so. And that is very important in preserving uh, a vibrant society based on respect for human rights and human dignity. So what are the, the institutions that make entrepreneurship possible? Um, these are institutions that are prerequisites which many people would categorize as possibly only characteristic of certain societies, the Western tradition, uh, or perhaps other traditions. But I think you're seeing wherever these institutions that protect entrepreneurship exist, people, regardless of culture, succeed and succeed very well. And perhaps we can reflect on some of the institutional requirements here in South Africa. Because there are definite ways in which the youth of South Africa in particular uh, do require some urgent reassurance that policies are being put in place that respect the inherent dignity of each person and their right to entrepreneurship as a first principle. And I think economic policy, once you have that serious discussion based on respect for the entrepreneur as a first principle, you ask yourself, what do you then require in terms of making entrepreneurship work? Because good intentions without sound economics can result in political formations that don't quite serve the long-term interests of South Africa. And ideas that are very, very populist, um, which really pose a threat and undermine investor confidence and the certainty that many South Africans feel in their societies. So what I would argue is that in implementing the institutions required of entrepreneurship, the rule of law, property rights, and respecting contracts, Often these institutions become ingrained over time in the society and in the people who are within those societies. And a free economy, often under the rule of, well, under the rule of law, correlates to greater degrees of economic flourishing in which human rights and opportunities become realities that generations later, later down the line come to accept as the norm. And I think of societies like North Korea and other societies where there has been great material advancement. And in defending the first principle, um, of entrepreneurship, there has to be a grounding in the South African context, which people here relate to that is not an abstract theory. And now, if you've had enough of academics, I would like to come to one core narrative that I think could be quite valuable in the South African context, which is 
what is our guide, what is our national glue that can hold us together as a country. In terms of personality, we all know we have Nelson Mandela. But in terms of founding documents, perhaps a case could be made for the Freedom Charter and for the principles inspired there. But we've got to be careful if we look at what those normative goals and standards mean and how they translate to sound public policy. Again, good intentions combined with sound economics. One could argue that unlocking the noble goals that are espoused by the Freedom Charter could be one of the greatest ways to build around something of a consensus on what we seek to achieve in South Africa. And of course, there is contention that you could take a particular document at a point in history and use it perhaps for political campaign, but I would think the goals that are espoused in that charter, the widespread property ownership, as is the term used, um, as well as ownership by the people, interestingly not the state, does hold some relevance for our society today. Uh, and I was fortunate to learn under the tutorship, if you like, of the late contemporary, uh, or the contemporary of the late Steve Biko, Tembenolo Chungu, who studied this, who worked this, who lived this, and who's now gone as far as to state that entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs would be the new struggle heroes in the South African context because they have the capacity to make real the material conditions and advancements and prosperity that politicians or politics cannot. Once you've set the political institutional environments in place, you have to go another step. Otherwise, many people will think that institutional environment is a compromise, is a sellout, and they're willing to resort to radicalism believing that, of course, they have no st legitimate inclination or stake in the system. So stimulating growth has to mean stimulating the greatest resource of all, which is the human mind. And people, not raw materials or natural assets, are indeed the foundation of a successful economy. Contrast the success of resource-poor nations, as mentioned, you'll see that those countries that have a lot of resources are often held back by corruption and the hallmarks of bad governance. And it's here that we recognize the entrepreneur as the key path to success. And as I'm reminded in my discussions with people in communities, uh, particularly those who are on the forefront of fights for the democracy, the struggle was not simply for freedom but for free people. Behind the quest for dignity and access to equality is one country where the souls of all of those who fought for a goal greater than themselves. And if we to recognize at a normative level, at an ethical level, that each South African is part of something bigger and that our economic then we realize our economic policy must seek to free those individuals to be such the best that they can be. And that's not an individualistic task. That's not saying, right, you're on your own entrepreneurship. Now make as much money as you can. Uh, but it's simply recognizing that that is the means, the measure. That's a very important way that we are to unlock growth. And so the task of the present calls us to give meaning to this aspiration South Africans have. The millions of people now who are still cut off from wealth, who are still cut off from opportunity. And uh, it's an opportunity in wealth South Africa holds. Many of us benefited from quite good, relatively good growth rates, even though they could have perhaps been better. Most people did not experience that improvement. Uh, and even if you are to measure perhaps at an ethical level access to social grants and infrastructure, the, philosoph the philosopher or even the sociologist asked, but what about the dignity of those people? Is that in and of itself a meaningful life? Just to simply have a handout, X amount of money more this month than you had last month. It, it's not necessarily fulfilling. So the entrepreneur has to exist in South Africa within a legal and political framework that protects private property and guarantees equality under the rule of law, while not suppressing the creative commercial spirit through unnecessary regulations and through a burdensome tax regime. And I would argue that specific to the entrepreneur starting out in South Africa, the person who lives the experiences of the majority of South Africans, they find a very, very difficult situation. And so a national agenda for entrepreneurship and a moral defense of entrepreneurship as a first principle is not just for the entrepreneur. I mean, it's for the country as a whole. Um, wealth creation benefits everyone. The jobs are created and competition leads to healthy pricing. And people are able to create entirely new opportunities in a climate of inventiveness that rewards creative solutions for everyday problems. And just the other day, I spoke to one of the Forbes top five uh, here in Cape Town. And what he simply did was he looked around him saved up the money necessary to buy a bicycle and then a scooter, and he realized that elderly people did not have access to chronic medication. They walked for two hours, sometimes they went without, and he started a very simple business that delivered that every single day. Now, you could have a strong emergency government crisis summit, we can't deliver medication to the poor, and you know, we have put various interventions in place, but here you see in a person able to step up and solve that particular problem. Now that's not to say that the government doesn't have a role for a social safety net, but it's to recognize before assuming state action is the first response that people themselves have enormous capacity to meet those needs. And I was quite sobered when I thought, what if 
that person's business was undermined if we had decided to tax all of you more um, and simply go and deliver chronic medication to everybody without recognizing people live in those communities and we might be out competing them with someone else's tax money. It, it actually seems like a bit of an, a moral injustice if you were go so far as to say that. The greatest improvements in standards of living achieved during the past two centuries have been associated, as uh, has been stated by Professor Landis, as personal resourcefulness and ingenuity under a system of property rights and contractual liberty. Now, property rights is obviously not very widely spread in South African society. It's for this reason, though, the, the factors related to the greatest improvements of standards of living, that entrepreneurs, regardless of their origin or their current level or standards of living, have to be at the heart of a plan to generate growth. The people who create the wealth need to be put at the front and center. And recent studies in economic development have identified the SMEs, as I'm sure we all know, combined with entrepreneurship or as entrepreneurship as the drivers of prosperity. Now, I think the elephant in the room in this case is often China, and I referred earlier on to the status system and material advancement under conditions of non-democratic governance. And yes, of course, there's the human rights aspects which are problematic. But if you were to take a purely materialistic argument and say, South Africa must take that kind of policy approach, I think you face on the economic level some challenges increasingly emerging in terms of where China is now. And lending proof to this argument is a recent study of China's modern economic development titled Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics, Entrepreneurship and the State. And it comes from within China where Yaxing Huang argues that that country's economic takeoff in the 80s was fueled by private entrepreneurship facilitated by microeconomic flexibility, access to capital and enhanced property protections. And some of that book narrates as does some others the fact that the Chinese government themselves were quite surprised when they said it's a problem to own all the food as the state. We're not achieving efficiency. We've got people dying of hunger. Just give people the right to farm and to own or the produce of whatever limited amount of land they have. And you can see economic takeoff is fairly s has been significant. Now, China at that stage, the point I wish to make on the notion of the entrepreneurial spirit and to counter Max Weber's argument that it's a, a Protestant ethic you know, and spirit of capitalism uh, that, uh, that is unique to one society. China had been a, an oppressive society. There was a history of suppressing creative entrepreneurship to the point of the death penalty. And it was not completely dissimilar to some of the nature of the way in which the apartheid regime suppressed the possibility for black advancement. And a change in the political framework in China stimulated innovation in a culture of enterprise that has brought over a billion people out of poverty in that country and others. And in comparison, in a sense, to the situation China faced prior to implementing certain economic reforms, South Africans' challenge, or our challenge, could appear relatively smaller. We have a first world infrastructure ripe for integration and we need a policy framework that respects property ownership and rewards innovation. And here we have an issue of property titling. I think something that South African society perhaps has not necessarily put it front and center. And that is that uh, private ownership is critical because it allows people the ability, first of all, to have something, to possess dignity, to pass on a resource, an asset to future generations. It grants people, but it also generates economic activity and a sense of pride, uh, you know, the ability to run a small enterprise from home and over time to access capital, whether it's to start a new business or to pursue additional education. And of course, we all know the arguments of Hernando de Soto, or many of us will, but that is something that probably needs to get brought back quite clearly into the South African environment. We had a lot of land that was deliberately taken from people, and perhaps it's time to seriously consider reallocating that land currently in the hands of the state back to people who had been directly robbed or exploited who are, or are poor as a result of the past injustices that exist in the society. And uh, of course, Tembe Nolo Chungu, more than anyone else, is somebody who points to this clear example who says that, yes, of course, we can have discussions on private ownership, but let's look at all of that land that is currently within the realm of the state, which we can immediately start leveraging as a basis for the creation of wealth, and also for a sense of dignity and restorative justice beyond, sorry, your life was bad, get over it, uh, forget about the past. There's something very, very important to the dignity of human people to be able to own. And for those who would say ownership is only specific to a particular society, I would say, a form of contractual ownership which emerges from time to time is specific. But the notion of ownership, whether it's for the sake of communally, in terms of a family, or communally in terms of a wider community, is important. Um, 
And I think we've seen that in Botswana, where the integration of the tribal chief system, together with modern characteristics of democracy that they found acceptable, have shown a country that's very stable and very successful. And I would argue that for those who think African society is somehow different, the reason, and academics have also shown this, that Botswana, being one of the poorest countries in the world in independence, has gone up to being middle income with a very impressive growth rate, is precisely because the institutions that naturally existed for those people were institutions that were least interfered with by the top-down statism that was colonialism. And that, I think, is a very fascinating, profound insight for those who would argue that neoconservative line, uh, that culture is somehow deterministic or overly deterministic. It's fascinating. I was fortunate to go to Grahamstown at one stage as part of the debating society, and we, we, we spoke an awful lot. But to go into some of the museums and find some archives of documents that had been correspondence between white minority farmers prior to 1913 and, and government officials, it was interesting of an argument or a lobbying effort to use the state to say we need to restrict black ownership because we're being outcompeted, it's threatening you know, our, our productivity and our viability. And you see the origins of using the state to undermine the rights of others, not just based purely on an argument of, oh, those people must be unequal, we're better, but an attempt to be one up through that monopolistic power of the state. And I think that's tragic because the great problem is how much wealth we failed to create and how many Raymond Ackermans and Herman Mashabas never came to exist because of that deprivation and how many do not come to into existence today because we haven't sufficiently altered the microeconomic conditions on the ground. And I'd, I'd like to quote empirical data to support that point. The small business project based in Johannesburg uh, of reputable academics and researchers has done a study which I believe the presidency has accepted on reducing the cost of doing business in South Africa. And it, it wasn't a very recent study, so it has been out for a while. It costs 105,175 rand a year on average to comply with all regulations in South Africa if you were to go by the book. How do you ever, ever break out of conditions of exclusion from the market? These are conditions that people who started generations, businesses that are now three generations old, they did not have to deal with that or contend with that. And quote, these are costs, these costs are purely red tape figures, the costs that accumulate because forms have to be filled out, understood, uh, and submitted. And often people require assistance in understanding it. I saw that in Langa, where a lady hadn't registered her business and taken opportuni opportunities because she said it's going to cost me 7,000 rand to understand whatever regulation I need. I mean, that is profoundly problematic. And if entrepreneurship is a first principle with human rights, you know, we, we object when the courts take too long. It's injustice when people don't see their rights if they've been robbed or if they've been hard, hard done by. But I don't think people realize that first principle right to entrepreneurship when they don't have the ability to be creative uh, and to finance a business and to see a business through to success. And I think unless we change the current situation, we're going to see the majority of people remain in the formal s informal sector in South Africa. Uh, and of course, greater pressure on the private sector and on the small, relatively small tax base. Um, and that tax base is small not because people don't want to work or pay tax, but simply because they choose to opt out of the system for these very specific reasons. And so if we're going to find that normative vision, we've got to uphold the values and traditions, I think, to which scores of national euros in this country dedicate their lives. And it's a recommitment that has to consider policies which have failed and replace them with fresh ideas. And perhaps some of the key challenges is where is the voice that defends entrepreneurship, not big business or established businesses, but those are very much in the process of creating wealth and new entities. Um, and it seems during our transition to democracy, stable macroeconomic frameworks were created to ensure um, investment was relatively well respected and people wouldn't have a capital flight. But that recognition of the wealth not yet created because of people who just did not have the ability to succeed. So in essence, I'd like to summarize on four points and then close this and these four points are more practical, but I would say I would personally view them in the argument made for entrepreneurship as, as a priority or as a foundation to the ethic, to the national agenda. South Africa's entrepreneurial poor, and in fact all people are marginalized from the market as opposed to actively exploited by the market. I think an important 
characteristical distinction because many people I meet say to me, but, you know, capitalism has failed us, we're exploited by the market. I say, do you work? Is someone exploiting you at the office? No, they're not even in the economy to start with. Um, and what is the market but the participation of people living out their dreams and, and their visions and being able to take opportunities? A significant portion of our apartheid-era land confiscations remain in the hands of government, and I think an audit of all states' ownership is urgently needed, and that's everywhere, and that includes Cape Town, and we're doing that audit, and the province is doing the audit. That's not to negate from issues around land redistribution on current privately owned property, and we see equity schemes and other things that are coming to the fore to address that. Um, but I think that's quite fundamental, and you can return property to the landless uh, through titling of superfluous state land, and providing capital proceeds if we are to take the move of perhaps privatizing some of our state assets, which are drastically undermining entrepreneurship. I think about the airline industry and the people who've gone under. And all of us who've suffered, you know, the entrepreneur tells me I've got to go to Joburg and he takes a bus because he can't take a plane, but he could have afforded a plane ticket maybe if he had a more competitive market. Uh, or she could have. Uh, again, the, the problem with economics, we, we always see uh, what we've lost but we never see the things that didn't come into existence because of bad policies and exclusion. Um, and then I would say that the country is uniquely positioned, and this is at risk of being, you know, uh, South Africa-centric on the continent, but we have, we're positioned to play a major role in Africa, should we choose to, because we have a highly developed private sector that scores very well on all the indices, the World Economic Forum uh, and World Bank reports. But the regulation compliance cost for entrepreneurs to enter that private sector has to be drastically reduced. The country as a whole has not been friendly to small business and has it been a policy failing, perhaps not necessarily we are a country capable of very sophisticated policy making. Sometimes we disagree about that policy, but what is the ethical or foundational basis for which we, just like we agree on human rights, just like we agree on the rule of law, uh, most of the time, how do we agree on entrepreneurship as a first principle, the right to act and to be creative uh, and to be a part of the economy? And I think it's a first principle that sometimes stands, into, stands against what Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit, the belief that actually the central agent is government or is the state in driving growth. And so I hope that through the argument, I first have this, you know, uh, dealt with that issue of the cultural bias or that form of um, conservatism which seeks to find somehow a cultural reason that people don't succeed and also deal with the issue of where Africa has succeeded. I don't think Botswana is a country we should forget in looking where they were versus where they came to and how well they've ranked. And you can say, well, Botswana had commodities, they got rich because they had diamonds. So many of our African societies had those commodities and we didn't reach that. And um, without democracy and sound institutions, many of us fear that other countries are coming in and taking those commodities uh, against the interests of local people who maybe you've got an economic growth, but it's not driven by the people. The people are actually excluded. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the summary that I wish to present. And thank you very much for your attention. None. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much, Gavin, for your detailed talk, and you're always very entertaining and interesting. What my question is basically, haven't you, haven't you lost the way? Mm -hmm. Isn't the main role of public policy service delivery mm -hmm. and getting out of the way and let the private sector focus on entrepreneurship? We need more laissez faire. We need less regulations. We need less laws. We need less assistance. We just need to be left alone to be able to do what you need to do without any, any interference. Specifically for sort of Cape Town, mm -hmm. service delivery, your, your sort of port a loop policy is a complete disaster. And that's where you should be focusing on, circus, on service delivery. But on the football stadium, you've been four and a half billion rand on an entrepreneurial venture, and you're losing billions of rands. Your sort of my city bus service is losing money, will be losing hundreds of million. Your liquor law sort of amendment act was an interference with the private sector and with sort of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So what my question is, isn't it time we have less regulations, less assistance, and public policy should focus on, on delivering services? Thank you. Thank you. I, I must say I agree with 
much of what you said, but perhaps with a caveat, though, on the issue of government making a loss. I don't think government ever intends to make a profit. Someone has to provide that infrastructure. Um, and so we all kind of enter into a contract with the state where we pay tax for government to provide those minimum basics, those foundations that allow people to then go into the market uh, and compete and have that ability to acquire material wealth. I mean, on the issue of public transport, I think that's important. Where those decisions take place obviously should be at the decentralized level. But in terms of things like liquor legislation, I'd agree with you. That's why I proposed reforms to the liquor bylaw. Not many people are happy with that, but they're on the table for the July Council. Um, and other infrastructure projects, are f unfortunately, wasn't on council at that time in the previous administration. Um, but I think there was a national commitment to one once-off project, which was a Football World Cup, uh, and many people saw that as an opportunity for the country to come together, and it was deemed that that public expenditure would serve a broader goal of publicizing the country to the world, but also getting South Africans to unify. Now, whether the trade-off was worthwhile or not worthwhile, I think it is a debate that anybody's welcome to have, but however, the fundamental principle is that the ability to enter the market is fundamental, as has been alluded to, and when there are interventions, they're not there to, st they're there to help people enter into the market and preserve their dignity. So if you intervene with service delivery and you provide people with a toilet or some form of sanitation, I would argue that's an acceptable social safety net uh, until that person hopefully is in the condition where they don't pay over 100,000 rand a year to try to start a business and they're not excluded from the opportunity of earning the wealth and having the property title necessary to build their own home and necessary to actually have their own flush toilet. So I'll stand by the kind of service delivery interventions we have. Um, I think I'm quite, it's interesting, sometimes I get into audiences where I'm seen as a socialist back at council, they think I'm far right, neoliberal, evil, crazy guy. Um, but I think we've got to be pragmatic as South Africans. And I certainly acknowledge the point, though, wasteful public expenditure. The barometer I use when it comes to public expenditure is, is it infrastructure-based, i.e. something that's going to be there lasting for a long period of time, like transports, roads, and basic services? Is it something that the private sector can provide? If not, it's legitimate. But if it's simply just more handouts, that is not only problematic on the level of, oh, well, I don't like spending tax money, I don't want to pay more tax. It's problematic, problematic at the level of human dignity. And that kind of social welfare grant has significantly undermined, I think, microfinance in South Africa because I met with a microfinance project. I was very lucky to be involved in at UCT. And they said one of the three top challenges is competition with the social grant welfare system. Now, that is not to say that social safety net is illegitimate, it's very necessary. But how do we ensure that the interventions bring people into the market versus having them dependent? So I think there's certain principles you have to ask when you distinguish the role of government um, and ensure that you're not undermining entrepreneurial ability in another area, i.e. that gentleman who was in the Forbes top five because he was able to use the profit motive to assist elderly people in acquiring their chronic medication, um, as opposed to some expansive government program, which would have undermined a very viable business that's doing well in Kailicha, um, and which is adding to a culture of enterprise. I mean, he's so respected, and that's why I think culture of enterprise is critical. People have got to believe they have a stake in the system and can succeed. But that would be my, response, my kind of response on that. Um, if people drink too much and they, you know, on the liquor bylaw aspect, I, you know, I, I had a big problem at city council with the belief that controlling hours would control assumption. I thought it was a fallacy and um, right to the mayor, if you like, because I hope council passes some reforms to that fairly draconian bylaw. That's just my opinion. We in caucus and in council, you know, can express our views on how we achieve a particular social end. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I apologize, sorry. I just ask. Um, you mentioned um, about ease of doing business and cost of compliance for entrepreneurs, sure. and I don't, I'm not exactly sure, I, I haven't read the document that you quoted, 100,000 mm -hmm. Rand. In terms of ease of doing business though, we're not, we, we're, reasonab we're doing reasonably well, so 50 out of 150 yeah. countries say, and so your, the cost of compliance really comes in paying tax. Mm -hmm. So a lot of guys will remain in the for informal sector because they actually don't want to give away 30% of mm -hmm. their profit, the actual compliance side of it is not that expensive, mm. um, especially now that you have that once-off tax rate where mm -hmm. everything just goes through once. Mm. How do you realistically propose changing the tax structure? Mm. Is that even 
uh, possible? Sure. Certain at the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee, certain reforms have been proposed in the form of recognizing in the first two years of business s people when they're creating wealth are constantly usually reinvesting if they're genuine entrepreneur trying to start a large enterprise so to give that sort of waiver for an early period as has been done in some other countries has been proposed as one way to help solve that particular problem i mean a lot of people i speak to it isn't just the tax rate that concerns them or the fact that it's 30 percent of their profit i think that 30 percent is too high in those early stages but it's also the fear of what if I do something wrong and what if I don't comply with a particular law and are they going to come and shut me down. Um, people are aware that they're protected in the informal sector if they're not registered but they do then suffer quite significant consequences on opportunities they missed out on, on ability to have a contractual agreement that says come on board and I'll give you X percentage and we'll grow the company together. Um, those compliance costs we can actually get a breakdown but it also does include the complexity of the regulations which necessitates that some people actually go have to ask for help in the fact that they don't understand it. They aren't particularly user friendly uh, and I think that's also problematic because if we realistically recognize uh, our ease of doing business the premise required to do business such as a good education system uh, such as you know a family where dad has access to a lawyer or you know mom is employed and she works for an accountant those sorts of social supporting social structures don't necessarily exist and so I think the point in that research what I deduce from it is that there is a need for a reduction in those costs will help with barriers and reducing the complexity of laws I think sometimes Parliament creates and sits in committees and creates various laws and things but the application on the ground I mean it's very very difficult uh, and the business licensing bill I think was a huge mistake and I'm very glad the minister sent it back um, because it's too vague there's no certainty so simplicity and certainty are important um, and over time people you know contribute back and pay the necessary taxes but if we can have a situation where there's more tax overall because there are more people in the economy, even if the tax rate is, rate is less. Perhaps it's my ideology or just my, my view. Well, I would say that that is desirable for South Africa. Um, but, but we're doing well, and especially in the BRICS context, um, I see research as well. But then again, there's concern that some of the stuff around BRICS is overrated and that it's not necessarily just entrepreneurship driving that. Um, economics is a dismal science. Try philosophy, it's also. <laughs> But it is, it's very difficult to measure, I think, that whole concept of what is unseen. And my, my personal view of economics is it is a social science more than a hard science because human beings are the principal actors. It's not the sun which is going to rise every day. It's people who are going to make different choices depending on their circumstances. And so I think human freedom and a recognition of human creativity is an important, again, coming back to the first principle of, of how you manage a society, that respect for entrepreneurship as much as we have for human rights, um, as freedom from, freedom from abuse, so freedom to create. Um, yes. Good evening. Yeah. Um, so, if the global world and the, and the African continent in particular mm were to critically and objectively entertain the idea of equality premised on the principle of equality of income. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would negate the spirit and the impulse of entrepreneurship? Because, I mean, in my view, we, we can have these debates and these discussions until we're blue in the face. Yeah. Unless we're willing to make some radical shifts in our thinking to close the gap between the rich and the poor, we're absolutely going to go nowhere. Mm. I mean, you, you, you talked, for instance, about the issue of state uh, returning land to address the question of ownership and the dignity that is, is brought about by a sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. I'd like to throw a, a, a practical example, you know, in, in terms of to entertaining the idea of equality and equality of income. If I'm, if I'm working in the mine yeah. and I'm the rock driller there, that is a critical function of that business. It's mm -hmm. as important as the office of the CEO and the CFO. And, and, and the fact that I'm a rock driller who doesn't have an education and that will be justified as the mm -hmm. fact that I must earn 4,000 rand as opposed to the 100,000 rand and by the CEO is another critical question that we need to address because education cannot only be seen in the context of a career, but education can also be seen in the context of ownership and human dignity. Now in addressing those 
fundamental problems do you think that negates the spirit of, of entrepreneurship? The answer is no. I think the practical challenge in the pursuit of equality, so let me step back. The whole critique often of capitalism and of rising income inequality, I think is often just a moral dissatisfaction with rampant materialism. Um, that's, that's at one level. And, and, and that, I think, needs to be distinguished because if we all have the ability to earn the same income but we're pursuing our same dream, our same ambition, that, that doesn't mean that we're not going to work a little bit, work a little bit harder. If, if you're doing what you love, you're likely to do it regardless of what you earn in, in many cases. But the practical problem is how do you not retard the price signals and supply and control mechanisms when you intervene and say, right, everyone must earn the same amount now. So there's that kind of practical consideration when it comes to the daily functioning of the market. So I would, I would argue that it's difficult to achieve that absolute same level of equality across the board, not because materialism is, is great and because we should all be having more, but just because it retards the ability of people to read supply and demand. So if I manufacture a fantastic product and 50,000 people want it. I have a product that's now I've got a profit 50,000 times more than someone who manufactures something and only his mom buys it. Now, the guy who's made 50,000 does not understand there's necessarily that's higher, as high a demand. Um, people want that simply because the ability to read those price signals is not there because we've said you can't earn more than X amount. Um, you're limited. So my fear isn't, my, I mean, I think materialism is absolutely rampant and fairly unacceptable, um, and it's quite a high level in our society today. But the problem is intervening at that level in the economy can retard the ability of people to read price signals and see what supply and demand is in the market. The critical thing there, though, I think in providing people with some level of equality is to ensure people have an asset base. So at least they have the capacity to get the loan out that allows them to compete with somebody like Mark Shuttleworth, who went to a very nice private school, great guy, but he, you know, he, had, he had a definite backing. It wasn't just him on his own, he had family and education. So I'm very, very big on ownership by people directly and returning assets to the poor so that people have a form of ownership as a way of entering the economy. If there was a way, philosophically, if that sound ideal or if that noble ideal could translate into some sound economic practice. I mean, that would be a model I'm sure many people would possibly want to live in that kind of society where you pursue your dream and everyone earns equality. But I can't ask 50,000 people, do you like my iPad more than the other? I have to attach a price to it and see supply and demand. So I think that's one, that's one aspect. Now, on the de there's a contrarian argument on economic equality that goes something like this, or economic inequality. It says, in how many instances is envy, that traditional vice, as it's called by the classics, a driver of people saying, but I want to have exactly what you have. It's a bit of a misplaced argument in South Africa because of a historical context. But take two people who came from the same background, someone who ha managed to make it on a Forbes list, uh, and someone who went to the same school, but perhaps just didn't see the value of that extra bit of hard work, um, or giving back to the community, or going out late at night and delivering to elderly people. In that process, some people made value judgments of which profit was simply the consequence of the fact that they chose to go out and serve people with a product or a service and that somebody else didn't. And it's fine if you didn't and you preferred to stay home um, because you thought it was more important to be with your family that evening. So value judgments and morality are critical and I don't believe that they should be ignored and I don't really buy economics as a value-free science in the sense that if something produces more goods, it's automatically okay, it must be a superior society. But I just worry that in terms of the sound economics, um, the way the world works makes it a bit difficult to achieve that objective unless we start by empowering people directly and having a widespread property owning society where people have a stake like Botswana. I, I think uh, it's a, you know, in philosophy, often people don't take economics courses. In the humanities, even at UCT, I wish I was a humanities student, more people came and understood economics um, because it would allow us, when we go out to become politicians and thought leaders and everything, we want to be changing the world, it allows us to actually realize, hold on a second, the world doesn't work in some construct of how we think everyone should behave. Um, but anyway, that, that's a separate matter, um, but I think it's very necessary. The humanities are critical. 
um, I'm a big fan of the humanities, but you can't have theory that isn't grounded in reality and hopefully we'll see more of an intersection. So it's not, oh, but your system's not gonna work, people are gonna be poor, versus, oh, but your system's unequal. There certainly is a, a middle ground. How the world works, economics, proven by descriptive analysis, um, and then, of course, a moral vision, which every country should be bound to. I mean, the Americans still quote the founding fathers, even though I'm sure they may not all like Barack Obama, but there's a spirit, the society progresses, um, and people hold to some basic values. And that was my allusion to the Freedom Charter. I don't think it's a scary document or something we should worry about, um, or it's some, you know, it, it's what Julius Malema says it is. There are different interpretations of what that document is. And it's very interesting, at a time when socialism was all the rage and communism really was credible as something that could work, they affirmed that it's ownership by the people. And there was a specific reference not to the state. And I think some of Ben Turok's comments, even though he's a communist, at the time of writing that document are very illustrative. And uh, South Africans, we shouldn't be afraid to look at, at what we have uh, in that respect. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Gareth. Thank you for your presentation. Um, one thing that I've noted is your presentation actually assumes already entrepreneurs that are existing in the market and a smooth process and transition in entering that market. But however, I think it, um, it was very silent on considering the facts that there's a lot of to be entrepreneurs that want to enter the market. Mm -hmm. However, there's quite a number of barriers that are associated with entering that market, like financial yeah. um, assistance, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that with government, we've got quite a number of institutions like Yesidas that try to assist um, young entrepreneurs, but of course it came with its challenges. Right. So what I'm interested in knowing from, with you being part of the mayoral committee and maybe specifically for the city of Cape Town, what enabling factors have you, yeah. do you have in place, for example, if I'm to be, um, I want to become an entrant in the market, what are the processes that are enabling um, by your committee in order for, for me to, to partake in this um, type of entrepreneurship right. economy? Great, well the first thing is uh, a one-stop shop program um, and the reason for that is that the key economic policy questions are decided at a national level. But local governments have an implementing role. And so our philosophy has been this, or at least mine has, and now people repeat it, so I think maybe it, it, it was accepted somewhat, but that we reduce regulations and barriers where we have the ability to. And if we cannot change the law, it is not national government's problem, it is still our problem they're legitimately elected government, we have to help people comply with it. So for example, with this gang violence problem in Hanover Park, a direct intervention is to say, we're making city facilities available, we invite the private sector to come, run your CSI, run your enterprise development. It costs us very little, it's a facility that is in the public hands already, but we leverage your wealth and your knowledge and your commitment to South Africa. Uh, that, and we know the citizens, we know the terrain, we understand we're not gonna put you in a violence hotspot. There, there's that sort of cooperative arrangement which we're trying to work on, and it, that's always a work in progress. It's just part of governance, it's never solved. But then in terms of proposals that we would have if we were to advise or be asked our opinion on national government policy, would be that in terms of providing that finance and that access to capital, it's in providing assets to people, and so we're doing a property tightening program now, that you have that ability to have something to leverage. And finance is not always strictly in a formal sense. Many entrepreneurs, if they simply come from a family, have those trust relationships, which are also almost institutions, social institutions, trust relationships in which dad or cousin or brother or mother lends a certain amount of money, but they have an asset or a base from which to do so. And getting assets into the hands of poor people is, a, a, I think, a very fundamental part of bringing people into the economy. So that would kind of be the approach that the city of Cape Town takes, um, and, and a strong caution against regulation uh, unless it's absolutely there to prevent doing wrong to someone else. So for example, we just scrapped the home industries policy, which required that you go through some sort of process to have a home business. So long as you're not interfering with anybody else, your right to free speech, just like your right to entrepreneurship, is not something we regulate a priori. Are you saying something you want to say or engaging in a sale or active entrepreneurship that is something you pursue as a matter of individual choice. We have now abolished 268 regulations in the city of Cape Town in the past two years and replaced them with one main zoning scheme. So we dealt with all kinds of things where still on the books you had you know, native yard acts and what you couldn't do if you lived in Googs because you're not supposed to be here unless you're working for someone and then going back to the Eastern Cape. And that, that helps and we hope that's gonna spur development 
where people know that they can predictably and easily do with their property that they own what they want within the basic regulations that ensure you don't you know, keep your neighbor up till 10 o'clock at night running a car repair business. And in those cases, their regulations, not to stop you being enterprising, but just to protect the rights of your neighbor. And so you will apply to your local council now if there are objections to a business. It's raised, we will respond only to an objection and then assess an issue um, and attach conditions only to the effect that the neighbor has proposed certain problems. So for example, if all your customers are coming to your shop late at night from your home through a particular entrance and there's kids there who are doing a trick and there's too much noise, we'll say, we permit the business, but can't you just open up the other room on the other side? Little things like that. Intervention only on the basis of protecting rights, which is the role of government to protect the rights of people. Um, and, to prov and that includes providing the social safety net and the means to get into the market. And to, and to intervene where necessary with things like asset allocation to ensure that people have that opportunity. Yeah. So I love everything you've said. It's really amazing. I've just did an honors in social entrepreneurship and I'm a student of international relations. Okay. So I'm passionate about politics and everything you've said is just amazing. And I have hundreds of questions, but the one that I'm beckoning to ask is, um, my dad was involved in, in the Eastern Cape in giving back land to people many years ago. He's late now. Um, and also inside of the context of you speaking about the human mind being so powerful, um, and my interpretation of what you said is it's pivotal in the transformation of South Africa. Um, my question is, you were speaking um, to giving back land, mm -hmm. and you also spoke to Malema. So uh, something that I'm curious about, or an inquiry that I'm in for myself as I sit here, is if we've taken back land or taken away land from somebody with Madiba's caliber and we're now giving it back to somebody with Malema's caliber, nothing wrong with Malema, he's amazing, I love him, he's, he's good in his own way. What are we doing before we give back the land to transform his human mind so that the land that we give him creates an impact as opposed to just being an asset? Sure. So people utilize that land effectively. Yeah. Look, one, one, it, it's, it comes down, I think, to practical considerations. I do not have a one-stop shop solution. One way is working actively with churches or respected institutions to explain the concept of, not the concept of land ownership, I think we all understand ownership inherently, but what it comes with and the associated responsibilities. Um, I have a far higher faith in people based on empirical evidence that many people don't sell. They, they realize that they own something and you know, any of us who acquire anything, no matter how poor I understand the basic concept of it's mine and I can exchange it for something. I don't think it's, we almost all seem to understand money because we understand value and exchange with social beings. So in terms of the anthropology of people at that you know, kind of academic conceptual level, um, I think that the worry or the concern that people are not going to be able to adequately use that land is oftentimes misplaced. Perhaps it's largely birthed from the f experience of people receiving RDP houses, bearing in mind they're not necessarily, they're not owners, and then renting them out. Now in most cases the people aren't being short-sighted in saying thanks for the RDP house, I'm going to rent it out and stay in my shack. That's their form of income simply because of the absence of a job. And they say if I have a job I'd gladly then up my living standard and get back in that house and not rely on an income from someone else. Um, so the way we worked microfinance, just my experience before government, was going to local community organizations and having an open forum or dialogue and inviting people to speak. Uh, and I've been very impressed. And it's not a people across the world who've worked in this tent will say the same thing at how human beings respond to, to ownership. It's something that tends to come fairly naturally because even if we've owned literally nothing, even if we possess something we found in the street, <coughs> It is actually something that we, we've experienced. Um, 
The empirical data, I suppose, is the most important thing to go with in societies where they have worked on property titling and land ownership. And I think, you know, the results have been, have been good. Pretty much like how the first principle of democracy evolved, where, oh, but we're giving people too much freedom, or they're going to go sin, and now, you know, they're going to uh, be immoral. Well, it tends to be that over society, even in conditions of freedom, most of us aren't necessarily bad people. We tend to fend okay. And I think a similar case exists in our engagement with material things and ownership. We tend to be good at that. I s and that, that goes, I suppose, into the area of anthropology. Um, but I think the economic data, you could argue, confirms that. Yeah. Thanks. I'm not checking my time. Sorry, I think that's, that's the last question. Sure. Um, so if everybody can give, get the big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Sure. I'm sure you'd all agree that it's been a very insightful, thought-provoking um, uh, topic and speech. And I'm sure there's many messages that we'll take back into our organizations. Uh, the message that I'll take back is that it takes a great deal of passion and the ability to take risks, hopefully calculated risks, uh, to be a, a based on a moral vision to ensure sustainability. Um, and I'll thank uh, Gareth for the opportunity and making the time. Uh, it definitely was uh, a very insightful uh, speech from your side. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. And Bia from Mazars and uh, Cliff Decker of Mayor and the Graduate School of Business, we thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be many other questions. So if people, if you have time later sure. on, if you can please take them, yeah. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, we do have a gift for you. Uh, hopefully you're going to declare it first thing tomorrow morning. I'll do it, I'll do it tonight. Yeah.